In today's show, we're talking Detroit Pistons and their season preview. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Fangio Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit Fangio.com slash Locked On today to get started. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. This is coming out, I think, Sunday afternoon in the States, and I think we're about a day away from opening up Basketball Monster. Don't hold me to that, but we are going to be opening up. Um, Plan is on the 14th of August, so we'll see what happens. Not everything is going to be fleshed out in there. Of course, we're still waiting on things like uh, trades to go down, but all the first run of projections have been done, and we're just waiting on a few things to open up. So Monday the 14th looks like it will be the day, and then things will adjust every single day as news comes through and articles filter in and all that sort of thing. But what we're here to talk about today is the Detroit Pistons, so we might as well start talking about the Detroit Pistons. All right, here he is, back on the show, the host of the Locked On Pistons podcast. It is Koo Cahill. Koo, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Last time, uh, last year, it was a lot of fun being on. I hope to have the same amount of fun this time around. Well, look, I'm going to throw out the the caveat that I threw out when talking uh, to Sean on the Raptors podcast. Everyone knows that I hate the Detroit Pistons with every fiber of my being, and everything I say about them is rooted in bias, and there's no reality in anything I said. This is what I got called out for. Uh, crew because I uh, factually stated that the Pistons were the worst team in the NBA last season. Um, I can't really do much about that. They they were, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot to talk about here and a lot of things that are interesting. And there's a lot of players I actually really like on this squad. There's just a few other things that I'm quite, uh, I have quite a few questions on, but we're going to go into the Pistons here. You're going to take me as the biggest Pistons hater in the world. Well, you aren't, but people are. I know that. Let's talk about how this squad looks and we'll start off by just having a look at what changed on the roster? So they draft the Sar Thompson, which I know that you loved at pick uh, at pick number five. We'll just start there. Like you love that pick. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that pick. I, that's who I wanted the Pistons to get for a few weeks um, leading up to the draft. It was him and Jairus Walker, who I had at five. Um, so uh, yeah, I was a big Asar guy. I was really happy with his with his drafting. I'm not too concerned about his overall fit when it comes to three point shooting. I think he's going to fit in just fine with all the other things he addresses. But yeah, I, I very much love that pick. He's awesome. I, I had him at five as well. The guy I had at four slipped down, with, which is Taylor Hendricks, which I thought would have been actually a perfect fit for the Pistons. A, a, a four who can protect the rim and shoot. Yeah, that would have been uh, awesome to get a guy like that. But I've got no problem with the side. I think he's an awesome, uh, going to be an awesome player and it is a, a fantastic selection. The other guys they added, Monte Morris, basically for free. Joe Harris, basically for free. Marcus Sasser, well, they had to pay a little bit there, which is a, a decision I didn't really 100% agree with. And they signed Malcolm Cazalon as a two-way. They don't have Corey Joseph anymore, which is a huge W. I think Hamadou Diallo is gone. RJ Hampton's gone. Uh, Dwayne Casey legend Rodney Magruder is out of there. And Eugene Omarui is gone. But also, of course, Dwayne Casey is gone. And that out of everything that's happened here, Dwayne Casey, he's not gone. He's gone from making coaching and rotation decisions. That might be, uh, look, no offense to the bloke, great guy, fantastic guy. And I know you probably can't comment on this, but he was a bad coach. And I think getting rid of him and signing what was the richest coach contract in NBA history to Monty Williams is just a gigantic upgrade. And don't you know, to talk about Dwayne and all that stuff, but you can just talk about how big it is to get Monty Williams in. Oh, getting Monty was a big deal. Um, I, I think a lot of my listeners know that I was a very loud Dwayne Casey critic. Um, like you said, a great man, just a, a fantastic human being, a great role model, great for the locker room, um, great for uh, to have him around in the organization. Still, obviously, helps some of the young guys who got really familiar with him, and he helped like really grow into young men. So for all that stuff, he's really good for. Um, but getting Monty Williams is a big upgrade. I feel like on the court, um, much more creative offensively, um, not as stale of an offense. Um, has some previous success running with two guards like Devin Booker and CP3 when the Pistons are their two best players. Looks to be the same kind of thing. Cade Cunningham, 
Jane Ivy two guards. I'm really interested to see how he uses both of those guys. Um, if he brings over some of the sets and some of the things he ran with Devin Brooker and CP3 over in Phoenix. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a big addition uh, because I think the Pistons offense has been a big issue. The the lack of creativity with their offense um, was a big issue. We talked about on the podcast a lot how they're at the bottom of the league in passes per per game. They're at like the bottom of the league when it came to who holds on to the ball the longest per touch. Uh, so they the ball really stuck with the Pistons and not a lot of passing ball movement. Um, and I think that's going to change with Monty Williams and his quote-unquote .5 offense that they've been talking about. There's two things that we are going to learn this season. One of them is Monty Williams had issues with DeAndre Ayton and Jay Crowder that led to big big problems, right? Ayton was disengaged. Crowder literally just sat out. We'll see. Is that a Crowder and Ayton issue or is that a Monty Williams issue who has been praised for being this great locker room guy, but you know when you have these two big issues with key players, yeah, I've got to see where that goes. The other thing we're going to find out, Ku, is if some of the asinine coaching and rotation decisions were Dwayne Casey or whether they were being pushed on him by uh, somebody else with a different sort of agenda, the guy that maybe brought those players onto the team. So I think some of the decisions we'll see from Monty Williams in terms of rotations, yes, they paid him a lot and there's obviously a lot of influence there, but we'll see whether was all of that nonsense Dwayne Casey or was it perhaps coming from somebody else? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think the main part of the rotation where you'll see like that kind of, kind of uh, – war really play out is probably with like what happens with James Wiseman. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be that that's, it's going to be interesting how they use him. I'm interested to see how many minutes he plays, what role he's necessarily going to be playing on the court. Um, and how long of a leash he really gets. Cause when the Pistons acquired him, it was like, yeah, he needs a lot of reps. If you're going to believe in his future and think he can get to that future, the only way he's going to get to that future you believe in is if he gets a lot of reps and at the time, it was, oh, the Pistons are so bad. They'll be able to give them plenty of reps for this year and next year, blah, blah. But now they've went out and got all these vets that you've just listed, Monty Morris, Joe Harris. They got Monty Williams. So do they really have time to just be handing out reps for that? I don't know. So it's going to be – that That will be the one area where I think that's going to play out. It's it's not even it's not even that, which, yeah, yes, he needs reps. But at some point, like, Troy Weaver has this obsession with, well, he was drafted high, must have been drafted high for a reason. Yeah, the reason was they made a mistake. Like, that's the reason why he was drafted high. But you can say that and the Pistons don't have anything to lose. They can develop him. But they sort of do because they've got a player who's clearly better and younger in Jalen Duran. And if you screw up his development as well, then what do you have? Two failed options instead of one who might be good and one who isn't? Like, that, that's my problem. with. It. And then it screws up things for spacing and touches for guards and all that sort of stuff. Like, so it's like, oh, it's all fine. It doesn't mean anything. Let's just see what happens. Like, that's I, I don't find that that's exactly true just because of the impact that it has on players at his same position, but also other guys down roster as well. So we'll see what they do. If they go back into that, I'm going to be pretty frustrated, as I'm sure you are. But the big question on this team, there's a lot of questions, but the big question, Ku, is Cade is ready to go. Yeah, missed that last season, most of last season with that leg stress fracture. We're seeing all these reports coming out. I was massively high on him at the beginning of last season. He struggled with his shot in those first 10 games, which of course doesn't mean that he was going to be a bad shooter for the next 70, but then he was done. He was out for the season. So we are ready. Year three, Cade is here. He's taking over, we hope. Uh, yeah, He. so I, I know as of right now, I've spoken with his trainer. Um, and obviously we saw what happened at the team or we've heard about what's happened at with the team USA camp versus select team. I had Ben Goliver on the podcast and he was in attendance for those games and, and, and the overall camp. And he talked about how Cade just wowed everybody in the gym. He really was turning everyone's heads. Um, and everyone was just in awe of how, how great he was playing. Um, Ben Goliver said on my podcast, he believes that from what he's heard that if Cade wasn't dealing with this leg thing and wanted to really be focused on his third year, he would have been not only on the team for this Team USA, he think he could have been competing for a starting spot on the Team USA team. That's how high they are on him. Um, and I, I can confirm that I've talked with this trainer, and and Cade's been he, – he's he's feeling good. He's feeling good. He's healed up. He's, his offseason is not being, you know, derailed or anything. He's having his full offseason. He's back to 100%. Um, he's going to have to get his conditioning under him. He's going to have to get back to playing five-on-five five basketball. Like, all that stuff's still going to knock off some rust. But overall, health-wise, he should be completely healthy. And yeah, I I expect a really big year for him this year. The surgery that he had on that stress fracture, from my understanding, is that when they do those surgeries, the success rate of them is very, very high. And the likelihood of recurrence of that injury is very low once you do that surgery. Is that the same sort of thing you've heard? 
Yeah, so that's exactly what I was told and why they made the decision. Him, Arcade, his his team, the Pistons, why they decided to go with the surgery. I'm sure I, I, they will never admit this, but I feel like obviously a little bit had to do with, oh, I guess we could just tank this year for Wemby, <laughs> and that could help. I think that played 100%. a little bit. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, I had um, one of my friends, he's in the medical field. I, I had him on the podcast and talked with him about it. And, yeah, basically that's why I was told that once you have this surgery, it's the whole point of it is to, like you said, kind of, you know, take away as much chance as possible of something like this coming up again and dealing with it moving forward. Um, and he also talked with Cade. He had someone on the team, Roddy Magruder, who had the same type of surgery. Um, Cade and Tim Hardaway Jr., who's been rumored to be uh, Pistons interested in earlier in the summer with the Mavs. He had that surgery, and he, him and uh, Cade have become really close over that surgery. He helped them decide about going with that surgery. But, yeah, overall, that's exactly what I've heard as well. I think Drew Holiday had it as well, if, if I'm not mistaken. If he didn't, yeah. he, he did have the same problem as Cade early in his career, and it's been 10 years and nothing's happened since then. So, yeah, I, got, I feel like confident about that. The other one is Isaiah Stewart, who sat out the end of last season with an injury to his shoulder. Well, it was an injury, but he was fine. We're not worried about him coming back, are we? No, I'm not I'm not too concerned about – well, okay, th- there are some things I'm concerned about with Stu, yeah. the player, but not – the shoulder, no, I'm not, not con- too concerned about it at all. All right, so let's get into – actually, we won't get into that just yet because I do need to tell people that today's episode, if I could find it, today's episode is brought to you by Fangel Sportsbook. Fangel well, – or the NFL is here. Preseason is here. It's – Done, we're ready, we're started, it's all on. And Fangel is giving you the chance to win all season long. Because right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time that they win in the regular season. Just pick a team to win the Super Bowl. Maybe it's the trendy pick, who the Detroit Lions. And every time they win, you get bonus bets for every victory. And you can use those bonus bets on spreads, on player props, on over-unders, and more. Who is this year the Pistons win a playoff game? I don't know. I... I... <laughs> I, well, if, if, you, if you if you say no, you've got you know, historically you would say you've got a chance of being uh, a lot more correct. But I believe I do believe in the in the Lions. I'm very excited to see if they can get back into the playoffs and make some noise. And if you believe that as well, you can visit fanduelcom slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sportsbook. That's fanduelcom slash locked on. And don't forget to gamble responsibly. All right, Koo, your projected starting five. I 100% agree with you. This is what I think that they will start with. I don't know whether you agree with me in saying that this isn't what I would do, but Cade Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, Boyan Bogdanovich, Isaiah Stewart, and Jalen Duran. I think there is almost no doubt they start this way. And again, it's not what I would do. I have put this out in previous tweets and Instagram posts and people disagree. And they say, no way. Like Asar Thompson's definitely starting or James Wiseman's definitely starting. But I, I don't see any way they don't run out this group unless there's a trade between now and opening night. I I agree with you. I I, I wouldn't start this five. I think it's 100% that this is the five they will start. But I would start – there's a few other lines. Actually, I have probably like two or three other lines I think probably will be better lineups. Um, maybe not better starting line. They won't ever start them. But I think throughout the year, by the end of the 82-game season, there will be multiple other lineups that are better than this one. Um, Cade Cunningham, Jay and Ivy, Boyan, Asar, and Jalen Dern, I think that yep. would go, go well. Um, I think even Cade Cunningham, Jay and Ivy, Boyan, Isaiah Livers, and Jalen Dern would probably yep. be a little bit better. Um, and then there, you could get crazy with it, but I'm not going to. The overall concern with the starting five is just Isaiah Stewart. Is he actually going to be an outside shooter? Because if he isn't, you're really weighing down the the spacing of this lineup. And it's not like he does a lot of other great things either offensively to make up for that. Like the whole thing is he has to be able to shoot offensively to make it worth it. Um, And I know he had a good, good, like 20 games of shooting really well from deep last year. And then he had the shoulder injury and really crashed back down. He ended up at 32%. Overall, it's all small sample size. So it's hard to know what exactly is going to happen. But yeah, I think this is the starting five that they're going to end up going with. Yeah, my, my problem with Stewart, and I've been a critic of, of Isaiah Stewart as a player, is that I just think he's overtasked in this role. I think that he doesn't move like he's a four. Like he's sort of, he's obviously big and strong, but he's not tall enough to be a full-time center. He doesn't shoot it well enough or often enough or have any sort of stuff off the dribble or attacking closeouts to be an offensive threat that way. Defensively, he's pretty good, but he's probably better defensively in the paint. And then he's, 
you know, he's not big enough to do that. So to me, his his role, like when the team is actually going to be good, it's just an energy big reserve. Like that's that's what he is. And they keep trying to force him into different positions and they've paid him in a contract extension, which is sort of the amount of money you pay someone who's going to be like a sixth man starting sometimes, sometimes not. But like, no, no offense to it, but at some point, like we need to understand what these players' long-term roles are. And I just don't see this as... Him. Maybe he completely just changes everything. But when you watch him play, Ku, it just he just doesn't move like a four. He doesn't move like the sort of player you want out there at that position. To me, if I've got a four, it's someone that I want to be able to switch down to play the three at times as well and be able to guard those sort of guys. Whereas I don't think there's any hope of Stuart being able to do that, really. So uh, Pistons fans love Stu. Oh, yeah, and of course. Saying anything- oh, they should. Saying anything remotely bad about him will get the pitchforks out and the and the torches. It's just it's crazy. Um, but I share a lot of the concerns that you have defensively. The thing about Stu defensively is his biggest, the, the biggest pro about him defensively is that he has good vers- versatility when switching on the guards. He's not someone that you want doing it all the time, but he has good versatility and can do it. So, but the concern, like the the. The idea there is that that's something you probably would like out of your backup five. Like yep. you want your five to be able to switch out on the guards. Uh, not necessarily you want him doing, you know, guarding wings full time. Like he can switch onto those guys and that's kind of viable as a five to be able to switch out. But full time, I I also have a little bit of concern about him being able to do those kind of things full time. Um, also offensively for me, defensively, I'm not too concerned about him. If he's not great at that full time, I don't think he's going to be bad. He's I, I think he'll be fine defensively. Offensively, he's just he's one of the worst finishing bigs so far over the last few years in the NBA. He doesn't have very good hands. And while he flashes sometimes some connective reads and sometimes flashes every, every now and then he'll attack a closeout and do something, it's nothing more than a flash. And he doesn't do it even he doesn't do it good enough for you to come on here and say, Yeah, that's something he's gonna be able to do this year. So you're basically relying everything on the fact that he'll be able to shoot threes and that he'll be the shooter he was the first 25 games of last year. And if he's not that, it's like, it's it's just very, I agree with you. I think his role down the line is just a backup big. And that there's nothing wrong with that. Pistons fans, no, a not. lot of Pistons fans think that's like a demotion and it's terrible and they eat, you're hating on Stu. I, that's probably his, it's not probably, I, it is going to be his best role down the line. It's just, this is a backup guy who can give you good minutes play hard, um, energize the game, and switch on defense. And that I think that's what he's going to end up being. Man, if you get a long-term backup big man or backup you know, 4-5 at pick 16 in the draft, that's a huge W. Like That's just what it is. And you mentioned he's one of the worst finishing big men in the league. So I had to look it up. Seventh percentile amongst, amongst big men at rim percentage finishing. And even compared to all big men, 32nd percentile in three-point shooting. And that's just not, not the guy that I want to be playing out there. I don't want to make this the Isaiah Stewart show because... We could talk about him all day. I, I think he's a valuable player. I just think that he's maybe over time. This is, again, back to that problem, is that the reason that he can't play a ton of backup center is there's two other guys that getting backup center minutes, most likely, who they seem committed to giving those minutes to. And that brings us to the rest of your rotation. You've got Monte Morris, which I agree, Alec Burks, Asar Thompson, Isaiah Livers. And you've gone with James Wiseman there as the backup center over Marvin Bagley. Now, Ku, let me put this to you. James Wiseman is bad. All right, I'll put that to you as my number one thing. Marvin Bagley, who I also think is bad, is better than James Wiseman. But I, I do think they might actually give these minutes to Wiseman over Bagley. And it is it is a real concern to me of the, all of those trickle-down effects. People will look at some of his counting stats from Summer League. I, I thought, I watched him in person. I thought he was bad there as well. Why are they so committed? Why were they, they were so committed to Marvin Bagley as a former number two overall pick? They traded for him and then paid him a, a above market contract and then you know, pushed him to the side and bring the new flavor of the month in there. Like, there, I, I have seen no evidence so far to suggest that he is worthy of any sort of investment at, at this point. But that that does seem that they are going to want to try it. And heaven forbid they put him and Duran together. If yeah, if if they. If they try to continue with the double big stuff, that's when we'll have a problem. If if they continue to try to play Duran and Wiseman together, that that's that's going to yeah. be a big issue. That's when you start talking about weighing down entire lineups, start weighing down spacing, start making life terrible on Kay Cunningham, on Jay and Ivy, Asar Thompson. Like that's when you start doing that. Um, as far as the back of five, I just don't see. I can't see them not giving James Wiseman all those minutes with how glowingly they speak about him. 
with how much they seem to, like you said, have committed themselves to his development. Um, I do believe that Wa- Bagley's better than Wiseman. We just talked, I just talked about this on the podcast like two weeks ago. I think Bagley's better at Wiseman than all the things Wiseman's yes. supposed to be good at. Yep. He's Bagley's just a better version of him. Mm-hmm. And if you want to be honest, like, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't the biggest Bagley fan, but like the last 20 games of the season last year, he actually did start to show some things that Wiseman doesn't like Bagley's just a better player right now. Yep. If I was going off of who like the best lineup and the best five to play, I'd put Bagley there. I just don't think they're going to go Bagley over Wiseman because Wiseman's younger. He theoretically has the higher ceiling. He's the one that needs more reps. He's the guy that Weaver had. I, I, I what tough. I think he had top, top three on his board. Uh, before his draft he's the guy that we keep hearing all these things about so while i don't think he's better than bagley right now i I think he's the one that gets the minutes nonetheless yeah look there's a reason that i call james wise and marvin bagley the fourth because they're the same player he's just a worse version like it's simple as that like he's just he's just not as good as him and while i am the biggest marvin bagley hater in terms of what his actual value is you're right because what and I, i talk about this all the time he figured out what his role is. Come in, play 20 minutes a night, put up some shots, grab some rebounds, and do do the things. Like he's never going to be a featured guy. He's never going to be a shooter. He's not a defender. He's not a passer. He doesn't do any of those things. But he came in, he did his little thing in 18 minutes a night or whatever it was, and it was good at doing it. And that is absolutely what you want from a, a player like that to figure out, hey, this is how I'm going to survive. I need to do these couple of things. This interesting part here is some of the teams I've done when I look at players that are under the age of 23, there's like two players on the team. The Pistons have, I'm just going to count them up here, uh, a lot because I can't count. There's nine players under the age of 23 currently on this roster. And a lot of them are core guys, Cunningham, Duran, Ivy, Asar. There's four key, key guys on the, in that group who are starters. And we've talked about Cunningham and Stewart. We haven't really spoken about Ivy or Asar at this point. There's also Killian Hayes, Marcus Sasser, who's just about to turn 23. I want to talk about Jalen Duran because I thought he was really impressive last season. I, I, I don't know whether the Pistons believe the same thing as me because, again, I just wouldn't have been marginalizing his development time to give development time to worse players. Where do you see Duran? Now, there were some positive comments in the offseason. Well, he's the only guy we're not putting a ceiling on in terms of minutes. But there are other people out there who go, well, maybe they might actually do a stupid 24-24 minute split here. What is Duran's outlook for this year? Oh, I I, I don't – I'm not worried about Duran at all. I, I, there was a There was a moment where I also shared the whole – they better not, you know, sacrifice his development for James Wiseman. Um, but I'm not concerned about that at this point anymore. Jay, I think from what I've heard, they're fully aware of what they have with Jalen Duran. They Good. they know that Jalen Duran is him. Um, that dude, he – people don't understand that he was literally the youngest player in the NBA last year. And you don't see guys play that well as the youngest player in the NBA. Like, that's – it's just – how well he played at his age, how big and strong and like how mature his body is already. It's just crazy. Um, I think Jalen Duran's going to be fantastic this season. Um, I don't expect him. A lot of Pistons fans are already, you know, expecting some, some crazy jump from him already. And I kind of always say like, he's probably like six, seven years away from his prime. Like it's going to, he still has a while to get there, but nonetheless, he's going to be really good. Um, the stuff that he has, uh, already that he's already pretty good at. Um, you saw it, at least we heard about it popping off in the Team USA camp as well with Kate Cunningham. Um, so I look, I think Jalen Duran's going to be fantastic this year. I think he's going to play 30 plus minutes, and I think he's going to be really good for this team, especially playing with Cade. I think there's a chance, there is a slight chance. Now, don't 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 bookmark me on this, but there is a slight chance that because Duran is now going to be playing with Cade and Cade loves having himself a lap and playing pick and roll. I think there's a slight chance you see a better season from Duran than you do Ivy this year because of that reason. I think that's I think that's reasonable. I think we saw a better season from Duran than Ivy last season. Points aren't everything. But that does bring us on to Jaden Ivy, who was the pick. I thought the 100% the correct pick there. I would have taken him higher than that. The feat with Cade is still a little bit weird in, in ways. And we really saw Ivy's numbers start to improve when Cade went down. And then at the end of the season, when he had the ball in his hands more. But now you've got Cade Cunningham back. You've got another guy who does handle the ball somewhat in Asar Thompson. So what's the, what's the key here for Ivy? Does he need to be able to 
you know, work into being a, a, a more of an off-ball guy, the way that, say, Bradley Beal has played in the past, where you can handle a little bit, but that's not your full-time role, because I, I don't think he's going to be... Well, I don't think you want him to be that guy who's controlling the pace of play the entire time that he's out there, because you want Cade to be doing that. So... Did you see things from Ivy that make you think that he's going to be able to succeed next to Cade, or is that fit not going to work long term? Uh, I'm I'm not concerned about their fit together much at all. Um, I, I, let me not say much at all. There is obviously some there's some things that they they're going to have to work through, but I'm not concerned about it happening. I, I think they're going to fit well together at Purdue. Uh, I didn't watch a lot of them at Purdue, but from a lot of people I've talked to. He played a lot of off-ball actions at Purdue, played, shot a lot of off-ball movement threes. Um, and then even this past season in his rookie year, I don't have it in front of me, but on Synergy, last time I checked, I believe he was in like the 84th percentile on open catch-and-shoot threes. He shot like 40-something percent on those, on open catch-and-shoot threes. So he's a, he was a better shooter on good looks than his overall three-point shooting numbers say on the season. Um so I actually think he will provide spacing. And even over the last like 20 or so games, the Pistons started to run some off ball actions for him that got him some movement threes. And he was hitting some, he was hitting a quite a few of them. So I do think there's some versatility that he has playing off ball that we didn't necessarily get to see this past season because Cade was out. Um, and they did. There was a point, it was a little bit confusing for me at the time because I was a Killian Hayes believer at that moment, but in the middle of Killian's like, uh, stretch when he was playing really well, they moved Killing to the bench and kind of went to this, okay, yeah. we're going to put the ball in Ivy's hands and we want Ivy to develop as a point guard. So you didn't get to see as much of Ivy off ball as as you're going to see probably this year with Cade, but I, I think he's going to do pretty well with it. When he did play with Cade in the first 10 games, I went through and like looked at and charted all the assists that Cade had to Ivy, cutting to the rim, moving off ball. He moved really well off ball off of Cade in those first 10 games. And I, I don't think that's going to be much of an issue. As long as he continues to shoot as well as he did on open catch and shoot threes, I don't think that it will be too much of an issue. My concern more so is on the defensive end with yeah. Ivy. But offensively, I think he'll I think he'll fit fine with Cave. The the Killian Hayes thing that you mentioned, and I noticed you don't have him in you didn't have him in your rotation, which I, I agree with. They're not making those other moves to to have a big part with Killian, who did show some stuff defensively, but the offense is still a disaster. My criticism of that when they moved Hayes to the bench was. Like that is what Ivy's going to have to do is play next to a guy who is running the offense. So why are you, why are you not getting him to develop those sort of skills there? Obviously, Killian and Cade are different sorts of players, but just let's see if we can develop something where uh, where he is not running everything because he's always going to put up numbers in that role, but he's not going to have that role quite as uh, quite as often as I guess he would hope. Let's let's talk again back to this this question. Are we going to see these two center lineups again? I'm not even including Isaiah Stewart as a center now because, again, they don't. He, I think he, down the stretch, I don't think he played like a minute of center really because they were playing Bagley and Wiseman and Duran there. And I don't, honestly, unless there's injuries, I don't think Stewart's going to play really any center at all this season either. I'm talking the combination of Duran and Wiseman or Duran and Bagley or Wiseman and Wiseman Senior. Like, I don't know how that is this. Is this a Weaver thing? Yes. Is he going to be forced on Monty Williams? Because Williams never ran that sort of stuff in Phoenix. I, I I very desperately want to say no. Like I <laughs> I I really don't want to see it. Do I think we will see it at some point? Probably. We'll probably see it in some stretches. I I, I can't. Im- Wiseman. Some of the noise around around Wiseman has been that he slimmed down so much, and that he's trying to become more mobile, and he's getting all that stuff. And then even in summer league, they played him and mm-hmm. Duran together. They did almost the entirety that they are down there. Um. So. Do I think they're going to do it a lot? No, but all of that makes me believe it's something that they're going to at least they're going to throw it out there every now and then. And I'm probably not going to like it each time they do it, but they it will probably happen every now and then. I've got no problem with them doing it as long as it doesn't take minutes away from other guys who should be playing in those roles, Livers or Thompson or whoever it is, like taking minutes away from other lineups that make more sense. Like if you're in a situation where you're absolutely strapped and nobody else can get out there, then sure, like go for it. Like who cares? But when it's taking away other minutes from other guys, that's when the problem arises, I think. What's the biggest change that Monty Williams brings, apart from um, lightening Tom Gores' uh, uh, bank account? Uh, definitely offensively. Uh, you, I went through and looked at Monty Williams outside of when they acquired Kevin Durant. I, again, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I went through and talked about this on a podcast a few weeks ago, that 
Phoenix's offense, how much they passed the ball, the average second per touch was just infinitely higher or lower, I should say, than the Pistons over the last few years. And that's something that they've desperately needed in Detroit. They, they, the ball sticks way too much, and I expect the ball to move a lot quicker and more often offensively. And, look, I know there's a lot of talk. Heck, I'm, I'm a part of it. There's a lot of talk of how – what's the best way to build around Kay Cunningham? Is he best suited in a heliocentric offense like Team USA had him running in the scrimmage apparently that he took off in? Is he best utilized like that like Luka – like Harden was, like Trey was in, in Atlanta a few years ago when they made the Eastern Conference Finals. Like, is that the best way to go about it? Or is it to kind of go with this new trend that you're kind of seeing in the NBA when there's multiple guys on the floor that can ball handle, that can attack a gap, that can make a read off a, a, a drive and kick, all that stuff. They have multiple guys on the floor, kind of like you just saw with Denver, Jokic, Gordon, Bruce Brown, Christian Brown, Jamal Murray, having multiple guys on there. Um, it looks like that's the route the Pistons are going, Troy Weaver, really spoke about it a lot. Even Asar Thompson spoke about it a lot after he was drafted immediately after. It's actually crazy him get that in depth about it as soon as he was drafted. But um, that looks like how they're going to go about it. And if you're going to go about that way, you need to have someone who really enforces free flowing and, 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 and ball movement and good decision-making and quick decision-making. I think that's the biggest difference you'll see with Monty and Dwayne. I think that the the ideal scenario. Look, I don't think that he can, Cade can necessarily thrive in a, a, a Luca size role. That's a, it's a like a 36 percent usage role, whatever it is. I'm not sure he does that, but as some sort of hybrid between what Josh Giddy and Shea Gildas Alexander do with Oklahoma City, where obviously he's a, a bit going to be a better shooter than Josh Giddy. He's probably not quite the level of passer, but he can sort of control things the way Shea does, but not quite the level of driver. Sort of a mix. Between those two guys, I think he's more of a... Re- now, Shea was a pretty high usage player, but not quite to the level of what um, Luca was. So I think something like that is probably... Or, or, I don't know why I didn't go the easy example, just Devin Booker where, from Monty Williams' old team. Like, that's sort of... Yeah, and we're going to see more of that from Booker this season, running as a point guard, uh, I think. Um, so we'll see how that all works out. Now, the question here we get to... Now, I am a noted... Now, the, the, I was taking the piss earlier when I was saying that I'm a piss and hater because I'm not. I just try to look at things objectively. I am a Troy Weaver hater. I just think that he is one of the worst GMs in the league, and I will continue to think that. I think he's made an, so a couple of okay moves, but just I and I've made it mainly it is I just disagree with almost every basketball philosophy he seems to have. Now there were quite a few things here that happened that have happened over the last couple of years, but mainly the coaching thing in the off season where it just seemed that him and Tom Gores were on completely different pages with the coaching, and now it seems that Gores got his way. And we didn't get Kevin Ollie in here as the head coach. So how long is Troy Weaver's leash here? Like, if this doesn't pan out, if these players that you know don't pan out, is 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 this it for him? Like, where is that? Where is that relationship? Or is it still like no Troy is you know, trust in Troy? He's doing everything here. I I think that we're at least at least another year away before there's talk about Weaver's seat being warm. I, I I think his job is pretty secure. I don't I can't imagine I can't imagine what would have to happen this year and for things to just like for his seat to really get warm. I, I don't think that's gonna happen. Um I think he has pretty good job security right now. And with the head coaching thing, I, my read on it, based on everything that I I had read and some of the things I had heard, was it felt like and again, this isn't just me. This isn't me trying to report anything. This is me reading between the lines somewhat. It felt like Weaver wanted to go more development next season. This season, he didn't want to go full on into it yet. He felt like the team needed another year and kind of wanted to take it a little bit more slower, which is why he wanted Kevin Ollie, who was the head development coach at uh, OTE. He wanted to kind of go with his guys, develop his guys, and continue to go that route. And it didn't seem like obviously that like Tom Gores very much was on that route. Um, and eventually, obviously, Tom Gores guys r- wish. Monty Williams, a great hire. I'm very happy that they ended up with that. Um, but Weaver, I think his leash is pretty long. Outside of like, I, I guess if like Cade, Ivy, and Asar and all of them like turned out to just be bad. Like if this year they started playing, they just weren't good. And now it looks like he's missed on multiple picks. Then maybe his seat could get pretty hot. Um, but all four of those guys, people are pretty high on. So I don't think, like, I think it would have to take that to happen for his seat to get warm this year. 
Yeah, honestly, I don't think that there's going to be any movement to fire him because I think all these guys are good. Like, I definitely would have taken Cade at one. I would have taken Ivy at five. I would have taken Asar or I would have taken Hendricks at five. You know, no no problem with any of those moves. It's more some of the other stuff that that I have concerns with. Like, I, I don't understand. Like, I think getting Monte Morris and Joe Harris on those deals, completely fine, right? Really good pieces of work. I don't understand trading up to draft an undersized older point guard in Marcus Sasser when your two top five picks or three top five picks over the last three years are all ball handlers in Thompson and Cade and Ivy. I like, would Sasser have been there at 31? Maybe, maybe not. Does it matter if you missed out? I don't know. Like there's just a few things. Where I go, like, What's the process here? Why are we giving up picks for James Wiseman when it doesn't make any sense for him on this roster? That's where my issue is, but none of that stuff's going to have any sort of impact on him being fired. It's more just that difference in opinion with the ownership through this prolonged coaching search. And you know, people might say, well, the Ollie stuff wasn't real. It was 100% real. Like Troy Weaver wanted Kevin Ollie there. He believes he's a really good coach. Like he wanted that. And I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, but again, I am admittedly just completely diametrically opposed to basically everything Troy Weaver does in terms of basketball building philosophies. Who's your breakout candidate on this team? Oof. Um, Jalen Duren. I think, right. I think, I think Jalen, a lot of fans, I think are probably going to say Jay and Ivy. I'm not going to say Cade because I feel like that would be like a weak answer. That would be like taking the easy way out. That, that I don't feel like that's fair. Um, but I'll say Jalen Duran. People in the in the fantasy space really hated on Cade last season, but he averaged 26 and 6. Like, they're pretty good numbers. And it was only 11 games, and he shot really poorly, 29% from three. But a 10-game sample size or 11-game sample size for shooting doesn't mean anything. Not to say he was going to be a good shooter, but the guy averaged 26 and 6. Like, if he comes out and gets 24, 6, and 8 this season... I, that's not that's not a surprise. Like that's really the trajectory that the guy is heading. Um, what do you think the one thing is that Duran needs to really step up, step up? Now I don't think he's ever going to be this offensive maestro or anything like that. I was I was a little bit disappointed in some of his rim protection stuff. So that's probably the one thing I'd be looking at with him. But again, he's still nineteen. No, that I agree. I, defense would be the thing I think he needs that do, needs to really take the next step in to really um, break out. It's rim protection, um, overall feel and drop coverage. He needs to improve on. Um, I know they've tried to use him, make him pretty versatile and different defensive schemes that he can run. I know they tried, you know, like I said, drop. They've tried switching him. They played high on the screens. They did a lot of different stuff with them. Hopefully to see him get better at those things, to see him become more versatile, but overall just a better rim protector as well. Because he did flash. There were stretches where he flashed like, whoa, this yeah. dude's like just really sending everything back and just deterring a lot of things. And then there were stretches where it was like, Okay, he didn't read that right, or he was late on this one, or late. Just need, and he's the youngest player in the league. You expect to see that, but I think that area, I don't need to see him trying to do post hooks and shooting threes or anything like that's not what I, I what what you need to see from him is become like a legit defensive big guy, um, protecting the rim. To put it into perspective, he is two years younger than Jaden Ivey, and he is a year younger than Asar Thompson, who still hasn't played an NBA game. So yeah, like he's still really really young, and there's still plenty of development happening here. What about it's really hard on a team with like eight blokes under the age of twenty three. Who who's a regression candidate? I think I know the, I know the one. Oh god, that's a tough one. I don't think Cade is gonna step back. I think Cade's gonna take a step up. Not Jalen Duran. I think it might be the can, I think it might be the thirty four year old bloke who averaged twenty points a game last season because uh Cade, Oh okay, Cade so I can pick anyone? Yeah, not just, just pick the anyone. young guys. Not pick anyone. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Then yeah, I'll take I'll pick Boyan. Yeah. Simply because Boyan, I don't think what he did last year is capable or, or is sustainable. I All think right. he probably had his best offensive season this past year. And I don't think he I think he'll I, I don't know. I, I think he's gonna continue to get worse defensively and he already wasn't good defensively this past year. If he can if he can maintain the offensive play that he had last year he'll come close to making up for the defense because this past season his on off was like minus 0 0.3 if he can stay around that then fair enough but like another year getting older yeah I if think he it, continues to shoot like that man it's fair enough but. i think i think it's going to be tough like he's he's 34 now he had a career high 26 percent ucg he shot 41 percent from three he look. He just did so much stuff because, and he had to because Cade wasn't there. But he doesn't have to anymore. So there's almost no way he's playing as much as he did, or he's shooting as much as he did, or, or getting as much touches, or being the focal point of the offense, which is what he is. Who's the most likely player to be traded, and is it the same 34 year old uh, starting forward? No, nah, I'd say Killian Hayes. Oh, and how are you going to feel about that when that happens, Koo? 
Um, I'm depending on the team he goes to, I'll be excited. I can't, I really want Killian to get off the team and go somewhere that gives him a chance to fight for the backup spot and really continue development because I thought he showed some progression this past yeah, year yeah. and there's some reason to believe that he might be coming around. He's still really young. He's younger than Jay. I believe he's younger than Jay and Ivy. He is. Yeah. Um, he just turned 22. Uh, I believe like two weeks ago or something. So there was, there's some reason to believe oh, that no, he sorry. might have been putting some things together, but, uh, oh. Yeah, I, I don't think he has any room left in Detroit. It's over for him here. Ivy, Ivy's actually like six months younger, sorry, than Killian. He just turned 22. Ivy is 21 and a half, it looks like. But he's still younger than Isaiah Stewart and recently drafted point guard Marcus Sasser. All right. Yes, let's, that was what I was looking at. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go to our win projections because despite what people might tell me, they were the worst team in the NBA. George, have you never heard of a rebuild? Yeah, I have. They still were the worst team in the NBA last season with a 17 and 65 record, minus 8.6 net rating, which is 28th. Vangel's got them up at 27 and a half wins, which is big. That's over 10 extra wins from last season. And Koo, you said, screw that. I'm going bigger. 32 wins. I'm, I'm probably less excited. 24, just because I think there's a lot of other good teams and I'm still not sure where they go. But they can take big steps forward this season. There's no doubt about that. But that is, that's a lofty number, Koo. So let me, re- let me phrase it this way. If they don't hit 32, is it a failure of a season? No. I, I, so I don't think it would be a failure. Because I do think 32 is like, a re- that, that would be a really, really good season, I think. Um, I don't think, I think it would be a fail. Honestly, I'm not going to lie to you. I think if they won 24 games, your question earlier about Troy Weaver might actually be like worth it. Like, I think they might actually be discussing if they only won 24 games. Good. Because the team, I know for a fact that the team feels like that if Cade was healthy, they may not have been much better, but they wouldn't have been 17 games bad. They would have been like 22, 21 games won. And then now instead of looking at like, if you're going off my projection, like 32 wins, Instead of looking at a 15 game increase, you'd be looking at like a eight nine game increase. So they don't feel like that jump. They don't feel like getting to like 32 games is would be really reflective of jumping 15 spots because they don't feel like they would have been that bad no, if I, Kate was healthy. I agree on that. So they, they could have been a 23. They could have been a 24 win team last season. And maybe me being 24, he was a little bit low. But I just think there are again, you got to get the wins from somewhere. Like someone's got to lose for you to get the wins. And I think a lot of other teams did improve. Uh, this season too. I've got the Pistons improving quite a bit. Um, so we'll say, like even the Wizards who tore it down, I'm not sure they're that bad because they they sort of rebuilt, but they didn't because they Jordan Poole and Kyle Kuzma are still there. So I don't know. We'll see We'll see how it all goes. It is going to be interesting, but now it's time for the fun. Cool. It's time for us to play the gritty, which is my name for this Pistons specific. Oh my goodness. Pistons specific grid game. You know how it works. We're picking one player per square. They've got to play it for both teams. You can't double up. If you get it wrong, bad luck. We can't do rarity scores because it is just you versus the grid. But what we can do is I'm awarding scores to all of the hosts based on one factor. We look at the, all the players that played, say, for Detroit and Washington. And then I look at the games they played for either team. And then I get whatever the lowest of those two numbers are and rank all of those players by the lowest games they played. So if they played 100 games for the Pistons and one game for the Wizards, well, that's a really good score because they only appeared once in a Wizards uniform. And then the five assists per game means they have to have averaged five assists per game in a single season while playing for the Detroit Pistons. So where do you want to start here? I have a quick question. Does Monty Morris count? They need to have played in a game for the Detroit okay. Pistons. So you want to go, you want to get them at least in one game. Okay, so I got I, I, I got a few already. Okay, so for the Pistons Wizards, I yep. got Ish Smith. Uh, Ish Smith is just absolute grid game legend. Ish Smith, oh, that's it's not a, yeah, he played, because he played quite a few games. That's not a terrible score. So I'm going to give you a, what is the score for Ish here? He gets a 38 Point four. It's on a scale of 0 to 100. So you get 38.4 for Ish in the Pistons Wizards because he played 140 games for Washington and 219 for Detroit. The highest one in that grouping, who was the Rick Mahorn was the highest in that group. And there was some random blokes by the name of like Wally Jones and Steve Malovich who were the lowest scores. Never heard of those guys. I'm sure you probably haven't either. All right. No, I have not. Where do we want to, where do we want to go? They sound like they're from 1932. Where are we going to go <laughs> next? Okay, so the next one I'm going to go with the Pistons. So the Pistons Raptors one has to average five assists a game too, right? No, no, that that they just have to just Pistons Raptors. The last one is just Pistons and five assists per game. So we're just doing Pistons Raptors okay. for this one. Then that changes my answer. Okay. I was going to say Jose Calderon, but now I'm going to change it to Svi Mikhailuk. Pistons Raptors. Oh, Svi Mikhailuk Raptors legend. Um, all right, that. Oh, he actually. Wow, 
there is this is a weird one because there's not a huge amount of actual crossover between these two teams. So while Speed didn't play huge amounts of games, he still gives you a score of thirty point seven three because he played oh my f- fifty six for Toronto and ninety for De- ninety five for Detroit. But there's just so few guys. The lowest scoring player that I even recognize is our oh, old mate Henry Allenson. Played two games for Toronto. Do you remember that one? Oh, he played at all for them. I yeah, didn't know he played. Apparently, he did. I, I don't. I don't remember that at all. But apparently, he did. He played two games for Toronto. It feels like it's a it's a bubble situation. But I don't know. All right, let's. Uh, who else? Which one are we going with next? Okay, so I'm, my score is just not going to be low, man. It's going to be so <laughs> high because all the names I'm thinking of are just like popular names. Um, I right, so for the Nets. All right. I'm gonna go with for the Nets. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick um, Spencer Dinwiddie. The Nets, yeah, that's a good one. Spencer, yeah, that well, that's not that's not too bad. Um, all right, so Spencer Dinwiddie started obviously in Detroit, coming off that torn ACL, coming out of um, college. Yeah, that's where he tore it. Um, looking at his number, as I just completely lose my place, twenty one point five three. So not not bad. We're not you know, not pushing above fifty. Twenty one point five three. He played. A handful of he played quite a bit for the Nets, but that doesn't matter because he only played 46 games for the Pistons. The lowest score that I can see of people that I know on this list, there's some bloke by the name of Bubbles Hawkins, which is again is a very fake name. Um, <laughs> I don't even know who these low score guys are. Pace Mannion, wow, there's just Dante Hall. There you go, Dante Hall played four games for the Pistons and five for the Nets. All right, where are we doing next? We've got Bulls, Jazz, or the five assists per game? All right. Did I, I did Anthony Tolliver play for the Jazz? I'm not at liberty to say. Oh my god. Um Okay, I, I'm just gonna go ahead and take the easy way out here with this one because I don't want to take the chance of Anthony Tolliver not playing for the Jazz because I'm not sure. Um I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, I'm gonna get laughed at for this one. I'm just gonna go Boyan with the Jazz, man. Just give me give me Boyan. Boyan Bogdanovich is a correct answer, but Kuru, you're not going to get laughed at because remember, Boyan has played one season in Detroit and he didn't even play the full season. So he's only played 50 games for the 59 games for the Pistons. So that's a 28.86. So that's fine. Oh, okay. Okay. So he didn't play. Like, let's look at some other interesting ones. Walt Bellamy apparently played one game for the Jazz. Um, oh, here's one for you. I, I didn't know this existed. Greg Munro, Pistons legend, played three games for Utah. I don't know when that happened I either. I should that one. I didn't know. When did he play for Utah? I don't... Again, I don't know when that happened. It, these, these these random... Greg Munro, is a, Greg Munro is a great answer. He's played for all these random teams for like two games. All right, we've got the Bulls and we've got five assists per game. Okay. Um, the Bulls... The easy one would just be D-Rose, man. But D-Rose played a lot of games. <laughs> he, played a lot, um, he played a lot of games for Chicago, yeah. He didn't play a huge amount for Detroit. I'll I'll go I'll go D Rose with the Bulls. It is again it's a it's an easy, it's a popular answer, but you know, to be honest, I I do forget that Derek Rose did play for Detroit at times. It's only a twenty five for Derek Rose there because he only played he only played sixty five games for Detroit. Wow, that is that's a low number. All right, last one. Assists I, per five assists per game. Let me tell you how many guys have actually done this in Pistons history. Twenty-one players, and the way you get a good score here is a player who has played the fewest games in their Detroit Pistons career who has had a season of averaging five assists per game. And there's no qualifier; they don't have to have played a thousand minutes in that season for it to qualify. So, who who are we going with here? I'm I'm going to go with Jose Calderon here. Jose is he on there. Jose Calderon is on okay. this list and he is a pretty good option because let me tell you the score that Jose Jose gives you it is a 7.02 let's go that's he, the best one right there he played 77 games the thing he could have done is Cade Cunningham's only played 76 games in his Pistons career Jaden Ivey's only played 74 games in his Pistons career as well and they've averaged five assists per game but one of the the best one you could have given was Derek Walton played six games for the Pistons and apparently he averaged five assists per game in one season. It probably was only. I was, think, I was, I was for real thinking Derek Walton. But I did didn't know if you got the five assists a game. He came through in that in one of those COVID years, didn't he? As a replacement guy, and then started and played like four games as starters minutes and then disappeared completely. Yes. So there you go. That was uh, that was uh, that was been the best answer there, but. You did well, Koo. You got all of them right. You didn't get any of your score over 50. That is a really good result from you. Now tell everyone what is happening over at Locked On Pistons. 
Uh, yeah, we're still going three day, three to four days a week. Uh, we just had Ben Galver on the podcast to talk about the Team USA. He was in person. He was there at the camp. So it was really good hearing from someone who was in person at that. Before that, we had Asar Thompson, uh, his trainer and lead or former lead trainer now of OTE on the podcast, Luke Cooper. He provided a lot of insight into Asar's work ethic, provided some really cool stories real quickly. Let me just say, there's this popular story going around that about Asar Thompson going and practicing at uh, outdoor at park. parks yeah. <laughs> because his high school gym has been closed. I just mm. want to say this. James' article was great, but I had that I, – I, 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 we got that story out on the podcast a few days before. So technically, not to, not to you know, toot my own horn, <laughs> but we, we, might have gotten, we might have gotten that uh, from Luke a few days before. But also we got Kay Cunningham's brother on the podcast too a few weeks ago he came in person actually and recorded in person with us that was super dope a uh, really good episode gave us a lot of insight so we got a lot of fun guests coming on um so go ahead and stay tuned for that go and check him out the kate ep- kate's brother episode was really really good uh, as well i have i've been listening to the uh, uh luke cooper one but i will go and listen to that one as well Ka- uh, kate Koo, thank you for coming on and uh, chatting with the pistons with me thank you man and that'll do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you are on YouTube, you thumb it up and you leave those comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.